On this episode of Georgia Traveler, it's college football time with Phil. Guest host Raven Torado takes on the Iberian Pig. Christine visits an amazing historic cemetery in Atlanta. Phil then heads to Athens for some rich music history, and I go down to Savannah with a few tricks up my sleeve. You know, playing football at the University of South Carolina was probably one of the greatest highlights of my life. I love college football. You too? Well then you need to come visit the College Football Hall of Fame. Let's check it out. This 94,000 square foot museum is a college football lover's dream. From the time you walk in the door, where you're greeted by the grand helmet wall, to the 45 yard replica football field, where you can try your hand at the skill zone. Now this is the place to be. Now, after getting my all-access pass, I met up with CEO John Stevenson to get a one-on-one -on -one guided tour. You know I'm fired up, man. <laughs> I, 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 know, I heard y'all got a bunch of stuff in here. We got a lot of stuff to show you. Ready to have some fun? All right, I'm ready, man. You're my tour guide. Let's go and do this thing. All right, well, this is the lobby. You got our big helmet wall here. You got a nice big painting by Steve Finley up there, local Georgia artist. You can see the field, of course, over there, our 45-yard long football field where lots of kids, and little kids and big kids, like to go out there and kick some field goals. So big kids can go and... Absolutely. Uh, Y'all know where I'm end up. <laughs> John and I headed upstairs to the second floor where we enter the Why We Love College Football Gallery Showcase. This gallery displays the iconic trophy case with awards like the Heisman Trophy and the new National Championship Trophy. So the first thing you get matched up with this great hardware right here, all these great trophies, is our new media wall, which is a one-of-a-kind piece of technology. All this media of every school in the country. Let me show you what happens when you walk up to it with your all-access badge. All right, badge. now I got an all-access badge. Something special <laughs> right. supposed to happen, right? Just by you walking up to the wall like this, you're going to get a special greeting from our friendly Chick-fil-A cow here. Welcome, Phil. And we got no beef with the Gamecocks. So oh, right. man. So now right coming. away, you're going to get a bunch of Gamecock media for you to look at right here. Custom for you. You got your own workspace here. You see a video like this, you can touch it, watch a video of your Gamecocks playing. All kinds of different stuff to look at here. Bill, this is the fans game day. This is everything outside the stadium, okay? This is tailgating, cheerleading, mascots, bands, traditions. It's fight song karaoke. It's digital face painting. Next, we explore the Under Armour evolution of equipment. Now, this is truly a throwback from the gear used back in the day to the cutting edge technology of today's equipment. And John, I'm going to have to be honest with you. I can actually show you the type of shoulder pads I had in high school right. and in college. All right. right about here. Right about here? No, we had, okay. no, I didn't have, no, 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 come on, come on. <laughs> like, now, I probably could have worn some of those, man, but they wouldn't fit. Yeah, I remember we, I had the double straps first, mm -hmm. and then as I got to be a senior, we got the new one and the single strap. So, yep. never got to that good yeah, stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> you ever wish you could do play-by-play -play for a ball game? Make sure you don't leave the second floor without checking out the AT&T Game Time. Visitors can check out the interactive Call the Play booth where they can choose from a list of great moments, listen to its famous broadcast, and try it out for themselves. 15, 10, 5, the sky, the sky. And the coolest feature is this 360 degree virtual stadium station. It puts you right on the field of college football's most legendary stadiums. The third level pays homage to the greatest football legends in college football history. This exhibit, appropriately titled College Football Hall of Fame, captures the stories and accomplishments of the players who broke records and won our hearts. It allows you to watch videos and images to learn all about the Hall of Famers from your favorite school. So if I was sitting here with you and I wanted to look at my Georgia Bulldog, it's real easy to go from here. You go search, school, pick your state, Georgia, pick UGA, and now I've got all the Georgia Hall of Famers looking at me. And it looks like they're in the room, and you swivel this thing to pan through the field here. So if you want to look at your other contemporary, Herschel Walker, you just pull him up, and now you can watch him play. All right, so Phil, I know you've done a lot of stuff here today, but have. you haven't even been on the field yet. You can't come to a football place and not play a little football. So we have a 45-yard long football field here in the middle of our building where you can kick a full-size field goal, hit some blocking dummies, catch a pass, throw a pass, have a little fun out here. 
This is also our main event space for that big, beautiful 36-foot uh, HD TV screen up there running live games all day so you don't miss anything while you're here. But the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl skill zone is waiting on you, so I think you need to show us your skills. You know what? I got some skills, but before I do that, watch this. Game on. I set it up. I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> Let me loosen up a little bit. Oh, I think I pulled something already. <laughs> yeah, line that foot up. Line that foot up. Then I'm going to take three steps back. Yep. Two, three. This is my debut as a kicker. What happened? That's, uh, that's no good. Look at the height. Look at that height. Look, <laughs> you see the height. height. Look at the height. I'm all right. <laughs> you're still going to have fun in here, no matter what level of fandom you are. If you're a crazy college football fan, if you're a new college football fan, a casual college football fan, or even a non-college football fan, you're still going to have fun in our building. Touchdown. I scored, and you can too. The College Football Hall of Fame. It's good. <sighs> There's a restaurant indicator with an odd name. Let's join guest host Raven Torado as she takes on the Iberian Pig. A city of homes, schools, and places of worship is the motto for Decatur, Georgia. But they left out one thing, the food. With various restaurants to choose from, it's often hard to decide where to go. But today we're checking out the Iberian Pig to get a taste of some of the best Spanish flavors right here in Georgia. The Iberian Pig is a modern Spanish restaurant that has been a hit since opening its doors in 2009. Owners Federico Castellucci and Chad Crete met in college and had always talked of one day opening a restaurant together. We knew when we were conceiving the concept that we did, we did want to do small plates. We did want to have a very beverage focused program with wine, cocktails, and kind of merging the small plates. We threw around a lot of different names um, and a lot of them uh, we're Spanish, and then we realized, you know, we didn't want to do something that was too difficult to pronounce. We wanted to get the concept across, but we wanted to make it comfortable. As you read anything about food or magazines about Spain, you know, Hamona Ibérico becomes the quintessential thing that they talk about. It's such a big part of culture of Spanish cuisine. And so the Iberian pig was something that was easy to pronounce. It kind of told you that, you know, here we're doing, we're focusing on the food of the Iberian Peninsula. You know, ever since then, we kind of, we rolled with it. Jamón Iberico, or Iberian ham, is one of the finest cured hams produced in Spain. Iberian ham comes from the ancient breed of pig found only on the Iberian Peninsula, known as the black hoof pig. The ham is cured for years, resulting in amazing flavor. Traditional Spanish cured meats, Spanish cheeses, and Spanish wines are the main focus of the Iberian pig. And you can see that by the many options on the menu. They offer over 20 varieties of wine and small plates that would please any palate. I sat down with Chef Chad to get the insight on how he merges the two. This is something that we did as a special that over time just became requested over and over and over. Eventually we got to a point where it was like, we just need to put it on the menu. We also, we have it on our regular menu and then we also have it on our dessert menu. It kind of goes both ways. So it's brioche and then we layer uh, mascarpone and a little bit of lavender honey and we sandwich that between them and then we make the French toast batter. That's and it's uh, I can smell eggs it. and cream okay. and a little bit of sherry, um, a little bit of nutmeg, allspice, some cinnamon and then we finish that in the flat top, seared foie gras and then on top is a little raspberry butter. So how should I, like just so get all you, of it? Yeah, you want a little bit of foie gras, the butter, uh, a little bit of the gastrique. And then a little bit of maple syrup, and you kind of got a little bit of everything oh, there. there so you're, you're, uh, you get a full, complete bite, which is, which is good. That's amazing. So, yeah, there's cool. a lot of good flavors, a lot of things going on. And then you I got to do this with it? So, yeah, and then a little of the palo cortado. So it's just got that nuttiness, that nuttiness-like aroma that just pairs well with the French toast. And so it's got a lot that going on. That is like the best combination. And they complement each other so they, yeah, in the best way. They, I'm they, obviously not really a graceful nice. eater here. No, it's okay. Please, enjoy. This dish is not meant to be graceful, I feel no, like. No, it's not at all, but awesome. Amazing. Can I have that for breakfast like every day of yeah, my you, life? You it's like I'm, can. I can um, cook it in my own kitchen. Next, I sample the bacon wrapped dates. They are stuffed with manchego cheese and walnuts and a romesco sauce. So does this go with cherry, They're just like the way? That would definitely go with cherry. Would it? Okay. Absolutely. You know, I think sherry goes with a lot of different things, but it's like chewy and smoky and salty and sweet and crunchy, and you get a lot of the different elements of flavor profile, so. That was awesome. So, oh my God. So. Y'all gotta 
try this. Next, I sample something I've never tried before. Octopus. Not gonna lie, a little freaked out by it. It's so tender, so you really just kind of a little bit of this. Underneath it, we have a little grilled grilled potatoes. Okay. So they've been comb feed, which comb feed just means cooked in fat. Yeah, I'm not a graceful eater. Either. It's okay. We're, we're um, so you want to get a little bit of that, a little right. bit of the pesto on there, and kind of go to town. All right, here goes nothing. And that's awesome. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. It's not too scary. No. Okay. Not yeah. like you think. Yeah, this is not what I was expecting right? at all, like whatsoever. So yeah, so it's good. But it's probably the way you prepared it too. Yeah, I mean definitely. I mean braising it certainly helps and yeah. then grilling it. This is one of my favorites. Verdejo uh, is a great fresh crisp, refreshing wine, um, and I think it just it stands up to the, the meatiness and the body of that octopus oh, yeah. and some of that herbal qualities of the uh, best stuff. So. Yeah, and it also, like, uh, everything pairs kinda, so well and together. And it kind of cleans your, yeah, like, was, rinses your mouth. I like which that. Which is a good pairing should. It, it's in between bites. Right. The whole idea is that, you know, essentially that it cl cleanses your palate, so you're ready for that next fresh bite. Lastly, but certainly not least, I tried the award-winning pork cheek tacos. They are slow roasted pork cheeks topped with fire roasted corn salsa, avocado crema, arugula, and fresh lime complemented with the house wine. I'm gonna be fat after leaving here. At the end of the day, I really just want people to walk away with saying, wow, that was an amazing dining experience. We tried food and flavors we've never had before. Um, we've tried wine that, you know, we weren't really sure of. We're used to drinking California Cab or Chardonnay, and we had this awesome Rioja. You know, I think a dining experience really revolves around a lot of different pieces that make it unique and different. And at the end of the day, making things that, you know, I know people can't replicate at home. Um, that they crave those flavors and those those unique ingredients that they know they have to come back and see us again for. Well, Chef, it's been awesome. awesome. I think I'm Thank just going to keep much. finishing this off Please and uh, salute. Please, salute. Thank you for joining us. Let's now join Christine as she shows us the place where the dead really come to life. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. It's listed with the Smithsonian. It has celebrities as permanent residents, and you can walk all over Atlanta's history here. Where are we? Oakland Cemetery. 1850 is when we began. There were about 2,600 citizens of Atlanta at that time, and so the city fathers thought, you know, we need to acquire some property way out in the country. So they came out here to what is now part of the Grant Park section of Atlanta to acquire six acres of land from a local farmer named A.W. Woody. Mr. Wooding owned a farm here. His wife, Agnes, was already buried on the property. So the city just sort of designed on a grid the original six acres of, uh, of, the, of the cemetery around her. And today, Oakland Cemetery covers 48 acres with about 70,000 permanent residents. And it is beautiful, a majestic sculpture garden and architectural treasure dedicated to the lives of lost loved ones. I know what you're thinking. Cemeteries are spooky, not beautiful, right? Well, not really. During the Victorian era, as clothing and living styles were beautified, so were those creepy graveyards. When the rural garden Victorian movement for cemeteries came to this country from Europe, sort of taking the scary graveyard out of the equation and making this into more of a, what a cemetery means, a sleeping place. So you see a lot of pillows where people are asleep or the graves are marked by cradles, almost looking like a bed. Which brings us to our tour. Searching for symbols, those laid to rest here express who they are even in the afterlife. Oakland Cemetery even gives you a symbols guide. Here is some cemetery symbolism 101. If you see a pile of rocks, that means it was a life built on a firm foundation. If you see a pile of cut up logs, that perhaps means it was a life cut too short. And throughout the cemetery, you will see these beautiful obelisks. Those date back to ancient Egyptian times, talking about a soul reaching towards heaven. Let's start with the basics. You will see plenty of religious and spiritual symbols here. All but two headstones here face east. They're facing the rising sun and many are following the Christian tradition. Of course, you will also see many Christian crosses, Celtic crosses, and stars of David. Angels are the spirit's guide pointing towards heaven. And a window or a gate in the middle of a headstone, well, that's a symbol for the spirit passing through to the afterlife. If you see a sheared column or one cut in half, that is the break between the life and the afterlife. 
More than 7,000 Civil War soldiers were laid to rest here, so of course you will see many Confederate flags and the Southern Cross of Honor. Seashells are a symbol of resurrection, anchors signify hope, and those winding vines of ivy, well, that means friendship. And there's all sorts of architectural styles here, especially in the 55 magnificent mausoleums. This is the Richards family mausoleum, built in this wonderful 1880s Gothic revival architectural style. It is so amazing and it may look familiar. Does it look kind of like a chapel? Well, you are right. In fact, to this day, people still have their weddings here. Whoa, wait a minute, weddings in a cemetery? Oh yes, in fact, this tradition isn't new. For centuries, especially during that Victorian era, cemeteries have been used for special events like weddings and just plain old Sunday picnics. Why, you may ask? Well, for many cities, space was scarce, and cemeteries were always well-maintained, so they were often used as public parks. Next, let's check out the famous folk laid to rest here, like golf legend Bobby Jones, naturally with golf balls and a permanent spot for a hole-in-one. Then, the most visited gravesite at Oakland, Gone with the Wind author Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell was actually bo born in the Old Fourth Ward, which is just a few blocks um, uh, north of Oakland Cemetery. And as a child, she would ride Nellie, her pony, to Nellie. Oakland <laughs> Cemetery. That's correct. Even Gone with the Wind character Dr. Mead is buried here. Well, sort of. The real doctor he was based on is Dr. James Nissen. Then look for Mayor Maynard Jackson. Hartsfield Jackson Airport is named after him, and he has a plot where he permanently overlooks the city he loved. That brings us to one of the most historic sections of Oakland Cemetery, the Confederate Memorial Grounds. In the center, you will see the Lion of Atlanta, based on the Lion of Lucerne, Switzerland, and he protects the unknown Confederate soldiers buried below. There are approximately 3,000 unknown soldiers buried here, in addition to the 3,900 we have in marked graves. And this sculpture was done by T.M. Brady. The Ladies Memorial Association had this um, commissioned after the Civil War. It's very symbolic. Look for the broken off spear in his back, the tear in his eye, and the Confederate flag cushioning his head. Nearby is another historic area, the African American grounds. Look for Carrie Steele Logan, who established the first black orphanage in Atlanta. Her orphanage is symbolized for eternity as an elephant protecting her young. So after you've toured the about 70,000 burial sites here, you may start to get a bit of a sense of humor. Maybe it's just me, but I find this one hilarious. Good old Wilburn, Tennessee writer, a life so fully lived, heaven had to wait. He just had to add life after death. Where is he? Gone fishing. Couldn't have put it better myself. Let's now join Phil as he heads down the Atlanta Highway to Athens for some rich music history. Known as the classic city of the South, home to the Georgia Bulldogs, diverse in food and culture, and you can't forget about the music, this is Athens, Georgia. The New York Times called Athens Live Music Central. Artists such as the B-52s, R.E.M., and Widespread Panic aided in putting this music town on the map. To learn how all of this came about, I take the Athens Music History Walking Tour. Our first stop, the Athens Welcome Center, where I met up with Paul, my tour guide. Paul, my man! Hello, how you doing? Man, I'm wonderful, how you doing? Good, welcome to the Athens Welcome Center. So you do a tour here for people to yes. kind of get an idea of what's going on. Yes, uh, we've created the Athens Music History Tour here in Athens, and it explores Athens music history from the 1801 the founding of the city all the way to the current day. Well, guess what? What? I'm ready for the tour. Okay. Let's go. I'm ready to give it. Oh, I go. love it, man. <laughs> East Washington and North Jackson Street is where gospel composer J.B. Vaughn's career took off. In uh, 1904, the newspapers were all abuzz uh, in Athens because a, uh, the, one of the best gospel music uh, composers in the state was moving to Athens there. So he also founded what was called the Northeast Georgia Singing Convention. The singing convention met for many years and during the 30s and 40s it actually met down the street here at the Linden House. Just a few blocks up the street, now currently the Copper Creek Brewing Company, is where widespread panic was the house band at a place called the Uptown Lounge. Well in 1983 a club opened in this location known as the Uptown Lounge and widespread panic was the house band for the Uptown Lounge for several years where they honed their chops and established their sound. Uh, 
They went on to become one of the more popular bands from Athens at this time. In uh, 1997, they actually had a uh, album release party in Athens that was held on this street. They set up a stage at the end of the block here, and there were over 100,000 people who had come to Athens to see this show. Okay, here we are coming up to the Morton Building. The Morton Building was built in 1910 by Monroe Pink Morton, a local African-American businessman. He built this building in this location because at the time, this area of Athens was known as Hot Corner and it was the central of African-American business and social community. The building contains a theater and it was one of the few African-American owned vaudeville theaters at the time. Our next stop is the historic Georgia Theater. Now this building has been in Athens since 1889, and you wouldn't believe what it was originally. The Georgia Theater was originally built as the Athens YMCA. After it was the YMCA, it became a movie theater throughout the 1940s, 50s, and into the 60s. In the late 70s, a couple of guys were walking by and said, wow, this would make a great club. Let's open it up. So they rented it out and opened it up as a music venue. In 2009, the Georgia Theater was severely damaged in a fire, but in 2011 was newly renovated into a concert venue with an open full bar roof area known as the Rooftop. The 40 Watt Club has a lot of history. Originally created as a rehearsal space for the band Pylon, it is now a famous iconic music venue. The name 40 Watt came about because of a single bulb that hung from the ceiling. The club has made waves in several locations over the years, but the tour takes us to its current location on West Washington Street. All right, now that I completed my tour, it's time for me to go and enjoy the music. So the next time you're in Athens, rock out to the history and music of this great city. The Savannah area has witnessed its share of duels through the years. In fact, there is even a duelist grave here in Colonial Park Cemetery. And as you walk around the park, you'll see some of the victors like General McIntosh and his unfortunate adversary, Button Gwinnett. But he did get a chance to sign the Declaration of Independence first. He was a little faster with the pen than he was with his gun, I'd say. And I found a place where people aren't dying. In fact, they're smiling even when the musical duels are in full force. Savannah smiles. This place has become a staple here in Savannah. Savannah Smiles, how did this come to be? Craig, the owner, came here. This was nothing but a warehouse. Yeah. No air conditioning, no plumbing, nothing. Wow. He created everything, built everything in this place. We've been very successful. We're a big venue. Um, you know, we hold over 450 people. The music here doesn't stop. The band doesn't take a break. It rotates. We do round robin when one gets off. And that way it constantly rotates so the same two people aren't always on stage. Tell me about Savannah as a music city. I think there's music going on somewhere in Savannah all, all day long, whether it's Tybee or downtown or wh wherever you are, there's, there's somebody playing music. At, at Savannah Smiles, we're kind of playing all different styles of music because it's an all request show. So we, we may be playing some Irish music or playing some bluegrass music or today's pop music, country music, rap music, who knows? We have a great time. It's all, all requests from the audience. So you get the requests. How do you know who's going to play what? You know, you never know what song's coming I sometimes. I, sometimes I don't even know if I've never played the song before. Yeah. I, may, I may be playing it tonight for the first time, but you know it and know the words or know the melody, something, and then over the years you kind of learn how to how to make things happen, make, you know, make it up on the fly. So. Yeah, but you are I notice you don't discourage people from dancing and getting Not on at stage. All. Not at, at all. We, we saw it tonight we already. En we encourage it. I mean, on, on, a, on a weekend night, we'll have, we'll have 20 bachelorette parties in here. Birthdays, bachelorette parties, what, you know, whatever, divorces, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, big divorce yeah, night tonight. Yeah, yeah, Look yeah. at that crowd. Well, I'm, a, I'm an Elvis fan. I know I'm from we, Georgia, we but I like you. Elvis, you know sure. some Elvis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all were right. You, I might be throwing in some Elvis. Were you ever an Elvis impersonator? Were you ever an Elvis impersonator? You could say that. 
Yeah, a little challenge. <laughs> very good, very, very good. You should get a beer first. Right? All right. <laughs> I just learned a little while ago, David, check it out, Valerie. David, uh, he, he placed 37th out of, out of 40 in an Elvis impersonated contest. What, is, what did you say, you won 12 bucks? At least. 12, at least 12 bucks. You're getting, wait, are you, will you put your shirt collar up? Like, for, like just like Elvis? <laughs> Big finish, big finish. They were dancing to the jailhouse. Hey, that's all for this episode of Georgia Traveler. I'm David Zelski. Until next time, pleasant journey. Georgia Traveler is produced in partnership with the Georgia Department of Economic Development. This is a GPB original production.